Hi, it's me, Matthew. I am one of the co-hosts for Book Club for Masochist, a Reader's Advisory podcast. Uh, it's a podcast in which we read all of the types and genres of literature, regardless of our actual interest in them. We've read everything from gardening to erotic romance, uh, true crime to alternative history. So we cover a very wide breadth of stuff. Every month we read a new randomly picked genre, and then on the podcast we discuss our appeal factors uh, and other related topics as friends and library workers. Everyone on the podcast is a librarian. Uh, we uh, also do format sometimes. A format can be something like manga, graphic novels, audio books, those sorts of things. And we added visual novels to our list of potential uh, formats recently. And uh, because that's the way random numbers work sometimes, it was immediately the first thing that came that we drew when we were looking for another uh, for the next genre for this month. So I decided to stream some visual novels because why not? Really, I guess. Um, and I'm streaming one called Blind Men today which I believe is about super villainy and stuff. Uh, so without further ado, let's get into it. Oops, I have not set it up apparently. Or I did, and then it didn't stop working. There we go. Okay, got it now. Uh, so it's just me tonight, so if feel free to uh, talk to me if you want or make suggestions for when I'm uh, for when I have to make choices. So let's get going with this. Keegan. When I was 7, I was sent to live with my uncle. I had just lost my parents to a car accident, the same one that left the right side of my face disfigured. Well, he seems to have an eye patch, but the rest of his face doesn't seem particularly disfigured. He did his best to make me feel welcome, but it wasn't enough. Bullied by my peers and ignored by people that were supposed to help me, I didn't fit in anywhere, and I spent most of my childhood thinking that it was somehow all my fault. One day, after I came home crying, my uncle pulled me aside and said to me, People are fools, Keegan, blinded by their own stupidity. They seek to destroy what they don't understand. But people like you and me were different, were better. Never forget that. At that moment, it all became clear. I finally understood what I had to do. I'd follow my uncle's footsteps, and I'd show them. So, what do you think? I'm only missing the essay section of the application. I don't know why the League even asks for one. There's nothing particularly evil but good grammar. I beg to differ. I feel that potentially one of the most evil things in the world is not necessarily grammar, but uh, citation formatting, uh, which I, I would put in the same kind of area as good grammar to some extent. Good punctuation, at least, I guess. I laugh nervously at my own bad attempt at a joke. The League of Evil is the highest authority when it comes to criminal activity around the world. They can make or destroy a supervillain's career with a single word, and even those that don't answer them know better than to oppose them. Membership is for life, and vacancies are rare and, f and, far, and far and in between. Even getting the opportunity to apply is difficult enough. I'm perfectly confident in my ability to deliver a flawless application, of course, but one can never be too sure. Which is exactly how I ended up asking one of my uncle's henchmen for his opinion on my application. Henchman. It's about passion. Common criminals are a dime a dozen, but being a supervillain requires true dedication. He claps his hands together in excitement. He's almost as enthusiastic as I am about the idea of getting to join the League, which makes the fact that I have no idea of what his name is rather embarrassing. His name's Henchman S, maybe. I don't know. Henchmen, henchmen have names, I guess. It's not that I don't care. It's that after a while, henchmen just sort of blend in together. During training, we were shown the video of the boss's speech at the Allied Nations. It was wonderful. Half the room was in tears by the end of it. It's the one about how powerful countries abuse the voting system of the organization to legitimize their actions, isn't it? I've seen it too. It's really good. It's not for nothing that human resources make all the new recruits watch it. It's just a few words you can really feel what the boss is about. What makes him different from all the other supervillains out there? You don't need to worry so much. Right from the heart and you'll do fine. Besides, you're Sphinx's nephew. Runs in the family. He said so himself, didn't he? I groan. Ugh, don't even start. It's bad enough that people think I only got through to the opportunity because of him in the first place. The last thing I want is for, for it to actually be true. Getting into the League by my own merits is the only way I'll ever be taken seriously as a villain. By them, and by everyone else. Do you think, do you think the general population cares if supervillains are in this uh, League or not? Or do you think, do, do, does the general population even know about the League? Uh, can you gamble 
are there odds of like which supervillain will strike which city next? Not to mention, he has this weird idea about how spending all my time down here is not good for me. And it's not something recent either. Because intelligence agencies were always looking for my uncle. We never stayed too long in one place. As a result, I was homeschooled for most of my life. But ever since I finished my high school studies three years ago, he's been trying to get me to enroll in college. An actual college with other normal people. At first, it was just subtle hints and the occasional comment, which I accepted as his way of showing he cared about my future. However, since last month, he's been bringing a bunch of pamphlets home. He went as far as outright telling me that if I was having problem, problem choosing, I should study engineering like he did. Speaking of the boss, when are you planning to tell him? I have managed to keep the application process a secret for the better part of a year, but it can't remain that way forever. I'm really curious as to what else is in this application process other than this essay. As proud as it makes me that he hasn't found out yet, I'm no fool. I know that luck has played at least some part in it. Besides, I mean it when I told the henchman that my uncle is my biggest inspiration. His approval would mean a lot to me. The next time I see him, I suppose, it will be better if he hears it from me now and not from the league after I get accepted. He hates being left out, and considering what I'm planning, he might just have a stroke. Well, there's your here's your chance. He's heading our way. What? He was not supposed to come back until tonight. The henchman shrugs. I turn around and see my uncle walking through the door. He's never been a particularly expressive man, but he looks even more serious than usual. Good morning, boss. The henchman salutes him, and my uncle dispenses him with a nod. As he leaves, he silently mouths a good luck in my direction. Traitor. You're early. That's the Sphinx, huh? I didn't... I expected something different, and I don't know why. Something more... Cat-like, maybe? More... Weird Sphinx cat skin? Maybe... More magical? <laughs> there was an explosion in the lab. There's a toxic material everywhere, and since it will take the cleanup crew a few hours to get rid of it, I told everyone to go home for the day. I look down and notice that his clothes are stained with some kind of black substance. Instinctively, I take a step back. He looks down as well, shakes his head, and waves his hand in a dismissive gesture. gesture. This is just oil. I was working at some of my old prototypes when I was informed of the explosion. Anything I can help with, boss? No. I want to clear up some space in the storage room. I'll get rid of whatever I can't get in working condition. And how many times do I have to tell you that you don't need to call me that? Sorry, I spend so much time with the henchman, it just rubs off after a while. Among other things. Uncle, really, that was years ago and it only happened once. What? As far as I know, only because he got eaten by a shark before it could happen again. What are you talking about? Hmm, yes, the time the feeding cage malfunctioned and our perfectly trained sharks decided to have him for lunch instead. What an unfortunate coincidence. The corner of his lips quirks up in an amused smile. I barely re resist the urge to roll my eyes. You- Ah, uh, uh, okay. Is this a giant plot hole? Does he, in fact, have more than one eye? <laughs> have you had time to go through the pamphlets? The entry exam begin next month, so you have to submit your papers as soon as possible. Uh, okay, so he graduated from high school three years ago. Does he count as a mature student? Does he have to go through the, like, application exams? I guess it depends where he's going. But, as like, I assume an international supervillain, he could go to any school in the world, really. I spoke with Madame Mantis. She said that if you're interested in moving to America, she'd be happy to help with everything you need. Anything you need. Okay, so they are looking at America specifically. Ever since she retired, she's amassed quite the list of contacts in the Board of Education. In fact, if you get everything else ready before next Friday, she'll personally write you a recommendation letter. Do you think she signs it, Madame Mantis? I've met her a couple times. She was a proper villain, the kind of woman that never does things out of kindness of her heart. Meaning that he either asked her for a favor, or she ho owed him one. Either way, I bet he's only telling me this so I feel pressured into enrolling. I'm glad that you brought it up, because I've been meaning to talk with you about that. You have? Does that mean you've chosen a college already then? Not exactly. Not exactly. Keegan, cut to the chase. What if I didn't want to go to college? He stares at me in silence, for, for what feels like an eternity. Finally, he closes his eyes and begins to rub his temples. We've been over this before. You need to do something with your life. I guess playing Fall Guys all day isn't, isn't going to do it for him. You do a good job around here, but you can't keep running around with the henchmen forever. Wait, just hear me out. The reason I don't want to go to college is because... I want to become a supervillain, just like you. 
In fact, I've already contacted the league. They think I've got a lot of potential, uncle. They are just waiting for me to submit my full application. When did you even have the time to do that? I... Save it. That's not important. Helping me out and being an actual supervillain are two completely different things. The League's application process is infamously hard for a reason, Keegan. Many people have died trying to impress the Council. Why do you even want to be one? Uncle, please. I've gone through all the curriculum of every major college in the world, several times actually. They've got nothing to teach me. I could go straight to a doctorate for about every field I'm interested in. What? Oh, I'm very, very curious about what fields he's interested in, because I do not believe uh, this at all. Why should I waste my time with the fr frivolities when with frivolities when I could be doing something that actually matters? You're the one that always says that people just don't know what's best for themselves. Well, I do. Besides, I've been helping you out practically my whole life. I'm not making an uninformed decision. I know exactly what I'm getting myself into. Are you sh are you sure about this? I've never been more sure about anything. Have you decided what? You're going to call yourself. Do you have a base of operations? What about a plan? How are you going to pay for everything? Do you remember the weapons dealer that sold you the parts you were missing for the death ray? Turns out that he also handles mercenary contracts, and he comes highly recommended in that regard. He said that he would lend me one of his bases and some people if I went over a couple of the blueprints the scientists are working on. How many bases does somebody have? Like, oh yeah, let, like, oh, you're in the market for a supervillain base. Well... What type do you want? Do you want a volcano base? Do you want an ice base? We've got seven different volcano bases available in different parts of the world. I know it's not ideal, but it would only be for a day or two. After I'm accepted in the league, I'll have enough resources to get my own. He crosses his arm. He crosses his arms, and there's another moment of silence. If you are serious about this, I won't be the one to stop you, but you're going to do this properly. Call the weapons dealer and tell him that you won't be needing his services anymore. You'll use my lair and my men. We'll draft a contract, and if anybody asks, you rented them. Thank you, Uncle. I promise I won't disappoint you. I feel you need a lot of motivation. Like, what? Like, does he want to be a supervillain to take over the world? Like, and if so, like, wouldn't his uncle be mad if, like, he has the same motivation? Of course you won't. Now, come, tell me more about your plan. A month later, location, National Museum of Science, Bonn, Germany. I like that this is uh, at least somewhat international. I pretend to adjust a strand of hair behind my ear, pressing the button in my earpiece to increase the volume. Boss, I'm in the control room. I've taken care of the security recordings. The police won't find anything of use in any of them. The men are all in their posts and ready to go, too. They'll be waiting for your signal. I'll stay here for a little longer to keep an eye on things. Please let me know if you understand. I nod. All right, see you in the auditorium, boss. What a kid I guess they're in the museum lobby or something. As an aspiring supervillain, particularly one hoping to join the League, there are two things to be taken into account when it comes to carrying out plans. Visibility and chance of success. Just like there's no point in doing something so uninspired that it barely makes it to the local news, there's no point in getting arrested on national television. Finding balance is key, and that's exactly why I've chosen Bond's National Museum of Science as my target. It's a beautiful place, and just like its research center hosts many important scientists, its vault is home to a lot of rare and expensive equipment. I have never heard of this museum. I don't know. I am assuming it probably exists, but I don't know anything about it. Des despite that, under normal circumstances, there wouldn't be anything particularly worth stealing here. But starting today, the museum will be hosting the Schultz Halt collection of rare minerals, its main piece being the famous Engelaug Diamond. Besides being one of the largest cut precious stones known to man, its purity and chemical composition make it one of the most versatile energy conductors in the world. In addition to the exhibit itself, the museum board has also invited Professor Schultz to give a conference at the end of the inauguration party. Am I going to kidnap him? I hope I'm going to kidnap him. Schultz is both a geologist and a political activist, and he's greatly respected in both fields. To make sure that no other villain interferes, I told both the League and my uncle that I'd be planting bombs in the museum and holding the guests hostages for a ransom. I love the idea that you've got to clear, like, your supervillain plan with the other supervillains. And it's like, oh, no, but I'm robbing that museum that month. You can't do it as well. Very few people are willing to risk getting blown up by a first-timer, after all. But actually, my real plan is... Uh, to steal the diamond to kidnap Professor Schultz. Well, I wanted to kidnap him, right? So let's let's go with kidnapping. I don't- diamonds are not- not my thing at all. What- does anyone have thoughts on this? Okay, let's go with kidnap Professor Schultz. 
As a public figure involved in politics, Schultz's disappearance will be all the news we'll talk about for as long as he's missing. Kidnappings are hardly in my area of expertise, but all things considered, they are pretty they are pretty straightforward. And it's not like I will have to deal with him for long afterwards in any case. I'm certain that both the Americans and the Russians will be willing to pay a hefty sum to get their hands on him. Americans and Russians? Not not other countries? If I had to guess, I'd say that they'll want to claim that they were the ones that saved him, making the other side look incompetent. Or maybe they'll use the opportunity to get rid of him while the blame falls on someone else. It's a great plan, if I say so myself. If my nerves don't kill me first, that is. But what if he's cute? Until Schultz's conference begins, there isn't much for me to do except wait. The only reason I got here at the beginning of the inauguration in the first place was in case the henchmen needed me for something. Unfortunately, this also means I've had plenty of time to go over the plan in my head, including all the little details that could go wrong. I hate to admit it, but my uncle was right. Being the mastermind of a plan instead of just another person helping out is a completely different experience. But it doesn't matter. When I join the League, I'll get to tell the story whichever way I want. None of the boring parts, none of the doubt, everything was perfect on the first try. In the end, I decide to go grab, grab a drink at the bar while I wait. The bar is actually more of a counter in one of the corners of the lobby than its own separate place. It's meant for people who want to get something to drink without having to find a place at one of the tables or wait for the servers to take their order. As I approach, the first thing I see is a man surrounded by a small group of people, most of them women. I can't get a good look at him from over here, but every once in a while, the whole group erupts in laughter. After the third or so time that it happens, the bartender walks over from behind the counter and says something to them. He probably asked them to either lower their volume or leave, so the group began to disperse right afterwards. Now by himself, the man takes a seat next to another blonde man. He leans back on the chair and begins swinging it back and forth. What is it in this context? The chair? Okay. No wonder he was surrounded by a woman. He's pretty handsome, and the man next to him isn't too bad himself either. Definitely a much better view than what I had at the lobby. A moment passes, and the man in the tuxedo says something. They exchange a few words, but the expression on the blonde man's face is so unfriendly that they don't really go beyond that. If looks could kill. You know, I'm very uh, disappointed in people wearing tuxedos. I think they're very boring. I'm upset that my character doesn't seem to have some sort of absurd supervillain out outfit. Hopefully, hopefully I can get one. Fingers crossed. I, I think that if you're going to be a supervillain, it is uh, appropriate to have a completely ridiculous out like a cape. Who doesn't want a cape? Really? In any case, I don't have much time to think about it. At that exact moment, the first man turns around and our eyes meet. I look away to see if he'll do the same, but he doesn't. Instead, I can feel him staring at me until I give up and look back. He makes a gesture at the bartender to order another of whatever he's having. Now with the additional glass in hand, he approaches, stopping right next to me and leaning against the counter. Having fun? This is Hunter. From his body language and his accent, I'd say he's American. I wave my hand in a dismissing manner. He seems boring. Not really. Watching the governor try to explain the merits of mineralogy has been the highlight of my evening so far. These things are usually more lively. Well, as lively as events of this sort can get. Last time, there's this professor from Columbia. What was his name? Anyway, he's convinced that Schultz's methodology is faulty, so we always end up causing a ruckus wherever they meet. Oh, what is this? This is, um... This reminds me of the story about the, I think it was the Edgar Allan Poe conference. And, like, at one point... Uh, someone who hadn't been there before asked about the orangutan and I think murder in the Royal morgue and like people got very upset he's like you don't talk about the orangutan because apparently it has caused too many fights too many ruckuses at the conference but this time the committee's merged sure that the guest list is as inoffensive as possible you didn't hear it from me of course of course drink he raises the glass towards me I saw him order it but I didn't see the bartender pour it so of course I'm not going to accept it I shake my head and pick up my own glass almost empty right now from the counter no thank you I already had one he shrugs and takes a sip it's quite good, isn't it? German alcohol is one of the two reasons I'm glad that the Soviets only got to keep half of the country. And the other one is... Germans! By now it's become clear that he's flirting with me. Whether he's actually doing a good job is a different point altogether. I'm not... I don't, like, I don't know. This... I wonder why he is he has found my character attractive, I suppose. I decide to flirt back, try to get rid of him. Try to get rid of him. I'm not interested in this dude. I want someone more super villainy. I don't have time for loud drunkards, as handsome as they may be. He laughs, puts down one of his glasses, and offers me his free hand. I resist the urge to roll my eyes and instead offer him a tight-lipped smile. The handshake lasts a couple of seconds more than strictly necessary, and instead of simply letting go at the end, he slides his fingers across my palm. 
I raise an eyebrow, but I don't say anything. He's not even being a subtle about the way he's oogle ogling me. Johns, it's a pleasure to meet you. Likewise. Don't take this the wrong way, but you look kind of young for an academic. I'm still an undergrad. I'm hoping for a chance to discuss my thesis with Schultz before I submit it. Asking Schultz for his opinion, that's quite a high bar you've set yourself. What's your thesis about? It's kind of complicated. I'm a smart man. Go ahead. Try me. God, why won't he just leave? You can leave too. You you can just walk away. You don't have to continue this conversation. In simple terms, I'm researching ways to improve the accuracy of the tools used to locate and harvest petroleum deposits. It would mean extract. It would make extraction quicker, cheaper, and more envi environmentally friendly. That's very impressive, even more so for an undergrad. With a grin, he puts a hand on my shoulder and leans closer to me until his face is practically touching mine. His breath feels hot against my ear, and mixed with the, the faint smell of alcohol coming from him, it's enough to give me goosebumps. Not the good kind, unfortunately. I take a step back to put some distance between us, hoping to throw him off balance. But instead of letting go or falling, he takes a step forward without so much as missing a beat. We actually end up closer than we were before. Maybe we could discuss some of your ideas in private? Are you like this with all the geologists you meet? Only with the ones that look like they could use the distraction. Should I take that as a yes? Maybe some other time. If I miss Schultz, my thesis supervisor will have my head. Some other time, then. He picks up the glass, chugs down the rest of the drink, and gives my arm a squeeze before turning around and walking away. Dude doesn't know, like, what no means. Dang. As soon as he's out of sight, I let out a groan. What a piece of work, trying to pick up people in a place like this? No wonder he got told to get lost by the man at the bar. What did he even expect me to do? He was lucky it was me. Anyone else would have punched him for his trouble. Uh, I think most people would not punch somebody else. That seems very unlikely. There's a buzzing sound from one of the nearby speakers. I turn my attention to it. First call, please proceed to take your seats. The conference will begin in 15 minutes. This is a weird conference. I'm very confused. I thought this was like the opening of an exhibit. That's very different from an academic conference. When the announcement is done, I head towards the auditorium. Other than the first two rows, which have been reserved for politicians in the press. Okay, what politicians show up at an academic conference? The press also don't show up to academic conferences. The seats aren't numbered. Terribly inconvenient for people that would rather secure a good place without having to enter early or wait too long for line in line for it. On the other hand, it's perfect for someone like me that would rather not have a name attached to their tickets. When one of the ushers takes my ticket, I recognize him as one of my uncle's men, just like the henchman said. He directs me towards a free seat at the corner of one of the middle rows. Perfect. Nothing would ruin a dramatic entrance like having to ask people to stand up so I can get to the stage. Once I'm at the seat, it quickly becomes obvious why no one had taken it yet. Sitting next to me is the blonde man from the hall, reading the program with an expression on his face just as unfriendly as the one he had back there. Excuse me, is this seat taken? He looks at me, shakes his head, and goes back to reading without a single word. Under any other circumstances, I wouldn't care, but come on, he talked to the other man at the bar, and I don't get more than a side glance? It's entirely possible for him to just be some regular guy with bad social skills and poor German but he didn't even attempt to answer in English either. I decided to give my gut feeling a try, and leaning closer to him and lowering my voice so that no one else will hear, I begin to speak to him in Russian. Uh. Oh, if only my Russian was better, and I could uh, translate this immediately. Uh, yeah, I don't think I can do any of this. Yeah, okay. I've heard that Russians have a lot of trouble getting travel permits nowadays, even those who have never been to the Soviet Union. I wonder when this game is set. Um, like, I feel like it must be set... Uh, okay, so it's got to be set, like, in the 80s or earlier. I can't imagine how hard it must be for actual Soviets to get out of their country. That gets his attention. Enough to put down the program to face me. It looks like he's assessing me and trying to intimidate me at the same time. If I'm completely honest with myself, why am I interested in talking with him? Because he insists on ignoring me, because there's something suspicious about him. Uh, well, he's su su suspicious, but I think everyone is probably suspicious. It's not uncommon to find Russian expatriates in high-profile events, but in general, they're pretty easy to recognize. This man isn't one. I went through a lot of trouble to make sure n no one would interrupt me today, so if there's something out of place about him, I need to know. Sergei. Me neither, but I imagine it's just about as difficult as finding someone that will teach your ru you Russian on this side of the world. His accent is very thick, even in Russian. Thankfully, I speak the language fairly well, otherwise I would have regretted my decision as soon as he opened his mouth. As with all things, it's a matter of knowing the right people. Speaking a language won't get you arrested, though. That depends on how you use it. And how do you use it? Who are you? Kito I can translate that one. Perfect. 
Uh, no one of consequence, as long as you don't get in my way. Uh, Nikito? Hmm. We exchange a look of suspicion before he goes back to reading, not without hesitation. It seems like I'll have to keep my eye on him. Third call, please remain in silence for the duration of the conference. We'd like to remind you that photography is restricted to authorized press. <laughs> Photos. Um, the lights of the room begin to dim until they turn off completely, and the auditorium's only remaining illumination are the spotlights above the stage. A man in a suit appears on the left end of the stage, followed by Professor Schultz. He stops at the podium, and soon any hopes of conversation are drowned out by the audience's applause. Please welcome Professor Hans Schultz, head of the Schultz Holt Foundation. There's another round of applause, this time much louder. After a couple of seconds pass, Schultz holds his hand up, and the whole room goes quiet. Slowly, the floor next to him begins to open, and everyone watches in awe as the case in which the diamond is kept raises from it. I had seen pictures of it before, of course, but it doesn't compare to seeing it in person. As you all know, the Angolo, the Ang Angolo, I cannot pronounce that word, the diamond is among the rarest gemstones in the world. Flawlessly, bo flawless both in its surface and its interior, it allows both heat and electricity to be conducted with a minimal dispersion up to, I pressed the button on the side of my watch. I couldn't risk bringing too much equipment on my person, but I managed to fit both a communicator and a small laser into my watch. At my signal, the doors burst open and the henchmen appear, while the ones that had been pose posing as ushers hurry to lock the doors behind them. My uncle only ended up lending me about half a dozen of them, but since the people inside have no way to tell, they are, they are more than enough. There are whispers of confusion at first, but the room goes completely quiet when Schultz slams his hand against the podium. What is the meaning of this? Security, get these people out of here. I wonder if we'll actually see Schultz, or if he's like only going to be portrayed by text only. I mean, if I'm going to kidnap him. I stand up, and I'm escorted to the stage by that one henchman whose name I should probably know by now. Henchy. While we walk, he goes ahead and hands me the controller for the bombs. It's mostly for show, since we only wired enough bombs to mess up some of the less important rooms slightly, but the rest of decoy is set to really smoke. Of course, they don't know that. There has been a slight change of plans, Professor. As I take the podium, I put down the control in front of me, and I signal henchmen to restrain Schultz. They both get off the stage, and he leads the professor towards the side of the auditorium. I wonder if, like, supervillains deal with, like, people not taking them seriously because they're, like, 21. Like, I feel like that's gotta be a pro like. Do you think, like, the League of Evil or whatever, the League of Supervillains has, like, an apprentice program? To me, that seems like the best way to get into supervillainy. Um, like, learn the ropes and stuff when you're younger. But it seems like it would be hard to get people to agree to that sort of thing. Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, please remain seated. If you cooperate and do exactly as you're told, no one will get hurt. When you look back to this moment in a few years, you'll realize that it was the most important day of your lives. Scientific achievements, political careers, everything you've done will pale in comparison to this instant. And that is because today, you have become part of history. You'll have the honor of witnessing the birth of one of the greatest supervillains known to man. Dr. Cyclops. Okay, that's it. That's that's a pretty good supervillain name, but you need to work in your costume. As of right now, you also have the honor of being my hostages. Hopefully, the government values your lives. I'm briefly interrupted by the sound of talking coming from amongst the seats. I decide to ignore it and continue. Enough to pay thee. When it happens again, I stop speaking and begin to look over at the crowd, searching for the sport source of the interruption. Which of the two dudes I've met is it going to be? Most of the guests have either a look of fear or discomfort in their faces, and some of them even shake their heads when they notice me looking at them. What do I have henchmen for if they can't keep people from talking at the same time as me? Finally, I notice that the henchman is out of place, standing at the end of a row rather than in his place next to Schultz. He seems to be arguing with someone. I step down from the stage to get a better look, and I recognize the other person as the man from the lobby. What are you doing? Sit down. I'm going to the bathroom, unless you want me to get sick all over the floor. He stands up and takes a few steps forward. Actually, it's more of an awkward stumbling. He looks really drunk. Hey, I said you aren't going anywhere. The henchman grabs his arm to stop him. Suddenly, the man turns around and punches him square in the nose, knocking him out cold in the process. Yeah, he's a spy or something. Stepping around the henchman's unconscious body, he puts a hand inside a jacket and checks out a gun. At first, I'm amused by the idea of getting shot by an overeager drunk, but he manages to point it right at me just fine. Agent Hunter, Global, you're all under arrest. Shit. People begin to turn to look at him, whispering to each other until the crowd's attention is divided between the two of us. Meanwhile, none of the henchmen move, unsure of what to do. 
The only security on site was supposed to be the museum's guards and some of the local police stationed outside. There was nothing to make us think that an agent of Global would be here, let alone armed. Okay, what does Global stand for? Uh, I think it's probably a recursive acronym. So Global, the G in Global stands for Global. Uh, so Global Law and Order hmm, something something League. Don't know what the all of it says. The henchmen couldn't deal with him through sheer numbers alone, but I needed them to keep control of the crowd. The henchmen could deal with him. If everyone begins to panic, it's not going to be a good day for any of us. I decided to try and bluff, so I shrugged and laughed it off. Nice try, but you wouldn't risk a shootout in a room full of civilians, or for me to blow this place sky high. I pick up the control and put my index figure in the big red button in the middle of it. See this? My men have put bombs all around the museum. One force fells move, and I'll push it. With you still inside? No, I don't think so. As for your henchmen, my aim is pretty good, and something tells me that none of them want to do to be the one that gets their boss shot. Guess we'll have to see who's faster. Get him. Oh, guess we'll have to see who's faster. Get him. The henchmen are getting ready to fire when I'm blinded, blinded by, a flash of, by a flash of white light. Out of instinct, I drop the control and raise my arm to cover my good eye, but the movement makes me lose my balance and I end up falling back. Grenade! Everyone down! Hold your fire. My vision is blurry, so much that I barely see the second flash of light when it goes off. I hear the people begin to scream, but the noise sounds distant, and if, as if it was in another room altogether. It's not much of a relief, but at least that means they were the flash grenades rather than fragmentation ones. It takes a couple of seconds for my eyesight to come back completely, and a couple more for me to regain it enough strength to be able to stand up. I look around. Half of the henchmen are on the floor, covering their ears in pain, and the other half still look too confused to do anything. Upon realizing that no one is blocking their way anymore, the people in the seats begin to run towards the exit in panic, pushing each other and screaming. By the time the henchmen try to regain control of the situation, the whole room has descended into chaos. In front of me, Agent Hunter points his gun in my direction and begins to approach, or at least he's trying to. His hand is shaking so much that it's obvious that he's just as disoriented as I am. I frown. Oops. Sorry, I don't know if you heard the buzzing. If it wasn't him, then who? It's the Russian. It's Sergei. He looks at me, then at the floor, and stops. I look down as well, and realize why. It's the control! He hurls himself forward and grabs it. I take the opportunity to kick the gun out of his other hand, but he holds onto my leg and pulls me down with him. We both end up on the floor, trying to wrestle the control out of each other's hands. While Agent Hunter may be stronger, right now I'm the one in better condition, so I manage to hold my own against him. We keep rolling around on the floor until I manage to flip him over and pin him down. Has anyone ever told you that this is your best angle? Shut up and give it back. As we continue to struggle for the control, I know someone getting on stage at the corner of my eye. I turn my head and see the blonde man from the lobby work up to the diamond's case and lift it up. It's a brief distraction, but it's enough to give Hunter the upper hand he needs to push me off him. When I fall back, the controller is sent flying into the air, and Hunter and I stare, stare at it as it lands right on the de detonator. Well, shit. Of course, nothing happens. It's a decoy. It's a decoy, isn't it? Hunter shakes his head in disbelief, wiping a bead of sweat with it from his bow with the back of his hand. But instead of looking angry, he seems rather amused by the whole situation. Having decided that his immediate business with me is done, he runs past me and onto the stage to catch up with the other man. They begin fighting over the diamond right away, trying to get, keep each other from getting a proper hold on it. They're pretty evenly matched at first, but the longer the fight lasts, the more Hunter struggles to keep up. Whoever the Russian is, it's clear that he's not just a random guest or some opportunistic thief. It will be an easy mission, they said. No one cares about this old rock anyway, they said. Why does the kid you even want with it? Don't you commies dislike everything that may be worth more than a ruble? Be quiet. That diamond is the property of the Soviet government. I've come to take it back. Global and the KGB. I knew there was something odd about those two. Good thing that I'm not here for the diamond. Let them fight over it while we get away with Schultz. Oh yeah, I decided I was here to kidnap the guy and I didn't care about the diamond. I walk over to where the henchman is and nudge him awake with my foot. He stands up holding the side of his head with a pained expression. His nose is bleeding from Hunter's punch, and he has a split lip. He's pretty lucky that he didn't get trampled by people on their way out. Pull yourself together. We need to get Schultz and get out of here before the agent notices. Can you help me get him to a vehicle? Yes. Go tell the others to get out and get everything ready. I'll hold Schultz back in the meantime. He nods and goes running to where the other henchmen are. They still look confused from the grenade, but they are in well enough shape to pick up their guns and head to the exit. Speaking of Schultz, where is he? 
The professor didn't leave with the rest of the people. Instead, he's been watching both men fight over the diamond. He obviously cares more about it than for his own safety. He's even too distracted to notice us as I approach him from behind. Professor, if you'd be so kind as to come with me. Shelts turned around, alarmed. I'm about to grab him when there's a loud noise right inside the outside the auditorium. I feel the floor move and I lose my step. Oh my gosh. I hope it's a supervillain with like a mole digger ship. It's probably not though. The room quickly begins to fill with smoke and dust and I cover my mouth and nose with my sleeve. What the hell? That sounded like a bomb, but how? Never mind, I'll figure that out later. Right now, Schultz is more important. The smoke gets thicker by the second, and it soon becomes impossible to distinguish anything more than a couple of meters away. I have just enough visibility to see two blurry figures through the smoke, each running towards the exit through different rows. One of them must be Schultz. The only people left here beside me and the henchmen were the professor and both agents, who I'm pretty sure are still on the stage. Damn, it's too dark. I can't see their faces. Boss, where are you? Over here! Between the two of us, it should be enough to incapacitate Schultz and carry him outside. Once there, the others will take care of the rest. I start to run toward the man in the black suit, the man in the green suit. What color suit do I think this uh, scientist would wear? Is he really boring and wears a black suit? Or is he uh, incompetent f with fashion and he's wearing a green suit? Because I can't imagine it's a nice green suit. I'm thinking green suit. So let's go with it. The man in the green suit. We're going to go after that one. I run towards the man in the green suit and tackle him with all my strength. He's a lot sturdier than I would have imagined, and I almost dislocate my shoulder from the impact alone. While I keep him on the floor, the henchman puts a hood over his head and ties his feet and hands. We don't even check to make sure it's the right guy? Dang. Amateur hour. Even between the two of us, it takes a lot of effort to get him out of the building. Also, I don't remember what color his suit was. He struggles so much that he actually kicks the henchman right on the nose at one point. God, again? What do they feed these people? We get him into the trunk of the vehicle and head back to the base. While the henchman drives, I change out of the suit and into my usual clothes. Every once in a while, we hear the professor kick the trunk from the inside as if trying to get out. It makes, it makes what's already a tense trip even more tense. Finally, after a couple of hours, we get to the lair. Sphinx's lair, currently serving as Dr. Cyclops' base of operations. Location? Somewhere in Germany. Cute. A couple of henchmen help us get Schultz out of the trunk and into the laboratory. I had planned to simply set him on a chair and put a guard at the door to keep an eye on him, but he gave us too much trouble in the way here for that. With how the day has gone so far, I don't want to risk him getting shot trying to escape. Do we still have that table with the straps? The one we used before we had the cell block? Yes. Bring it over and tie Schultz down. The less he can move, the better. He nods. Just as he's about to leave, he touches his nose and he stops to gesture at the other two henchmen to go with him. They return a couple of minutes later, carrying the table with them. That thing's probably older than I am. I'm proof that half the things at this warehouse, at the warehouse are there for purely nostalgic reasons. The henchmen put their table down in the middle of the laboratory and they secure it to the floor. While two of them cut the ropes around Schultz's hands and feet and lift him onto the table, the others strap him down to it. Schultz is thrashes and kicks her until the very last moment, shouting curses at us. I wonder if it's Schultz. Is it actually Schultz? At least, I think that's what he's doing. The head muffles a lot of it, so it just sounds like distant yelling and heavy breathing. Well, despite all the setbacks, we did it. Congratulations, everyone. The henchmen nod and give me half-hearted smiles that make them look more relieved than happy. They probably thought I was going to blame them for what happened at the museum. Which, to be honest, I would have done if we had come back empty-handed. I still need to figure out how we missed two agents. Someone in intelligence is going to have to answer for that. But that matter, that's a matter for another time. Now, I get close to the table, leaning over so that I'm right in front of the professor. Oh, it's time to see if I'm incompetent. At my signal, the henchman standing closest to Schultz grabs the hood and covering his head and takes it off. You've given us a lot of trouble, professor. Schultz? Oh, it's not him. Who is it? Who is it? Oh. The Russian. But just as his face becomes visible, the whole room freezes. The man at the table is not Schultz. It's the Russian. You... I couldn't remember what color suits they were wearing. The henchmen exchange a nervous look between them for about a second before turning to stare at me. I try to clear my throat in an authoritative manner, but it sounds more like I'm trying not to choke. Keep an eye on him. Don't let him move a muscle until I come back. I take a couple of steps back, and as soon as I'm sure that nobody can see me anymore, I run out of the laboratory. When he agreed to lend me the lair, my uncle did so with the condition that he'd spend the day working in his office. Close enough to keep an eye on me, but out of sight as not to be fastidious about it. I'm like, sorry, I'm getting distracted by all the books on the shelves. 
in the other decorations. What is that weird light thing? I don't know. Not the green light, the, the white rectangle one. At the time, I wasn't too happy about it, but now I, could be, I couldn't be more glad that he was so insistent. When I get there, I don't even bother knocking. Knowing that the door will be unlocked, I simply storm inside. Uncle. But instead of my uncle, I find Madame Mantis sitting behind his desk. As soon as she sees me, she stands up, walking over until she's close enough to put a hand on my shoulder. My first instinct is to try to compose myself and pretend that there's nothing wrong, so I force myself to smile. Madame Mantis, to what do I owe the pleasure? <laughs> uh, now that is a very low-cut dr dress. I heard that you wanted to apply to the League, and I came to make sure that Sphinx... <laughs> cool. Good job, me. I've just dropped my phone. Uh, wasn't giving you too much trouble. I know he can be difficult. One second, please. I'm great at this. When he said that you'd give me a letter for college, I thought that maybe you also... I am, but only because it's always good to have more options. Your uncle and I hardly agree on this. Anyway, he saw what happened at the museum on the news and decided to do some investigating on his own. He asked me to stay here, just in case. He should be back in a couple of hours. Hours? This is just keeps getting worse. Your uncle is very worried about, worried about you, and you're lucky he's already bald. Mantis pats me on the shoulder before moving her arm away. She then circles me a couple of times before walking all the way to the door and locking it. Uh, Reckless T in the chat saying, The weird white laptop lamp is bothering me. What is it? Yeah, that, that is exactly what I was talking about. Like, I don't understand what that is. At first, I was like, is it a weird briefcase or suitcase? But, like, it's a lamp, right? It's like, I don't I don't get it. What is it? Is it like, a, maybe it's a whiteboard? Could it be a whiteboard? Yeah, maybe. Like, that at least the bottom part could be a whiteboard. Uh, like a portable whiteboard thing. Still is very strange. You'd think that, like, something would be written on it to indicate it was a whiteboard, though. Anyway. Now, why are you really here? I, huh? I just wanted to let him know that I was back already and that I'm safe. You can't hide things from me, dear. Very few people can. You came running in, and you looked like you saw, just saw a ghost. I wish I saw a ghost. Ghost Seeing ghosts would make most games better, in my opinion. If you let me help, we can figure something out before he comes back. I take a deep breath while I consider my options. The last thing I want is more people knowing about what happened than it's necessary, but Mantis would gain nothing out of telling people I messed up. Uh, in the, from the chat, looks almost like a photo shoot light? I have no clue. Yeah, it's very funny that there's like behind mantis now there's that weird like spinny green light that is like clearly very like super villainy and that one we don't we're like yep that's a super villain light that's fine uh and then this other thing that looks kind of normal is the one that we can't figure out what the hell is going on with it and we're like what is this thing uh besides she gets along reasonably well with my uncle there's a good chance that she really just means to help me she's right if i fix this before my uncle comes back i can pretend it never happened he doesn't have to find out at all Things in the museum didn't exactly go as planned. To keep it short, I decided to bring back a hostage. But I wanted to bring back one of the speakers, Professor Schultz. But the place was too dark, and with all the confusion, we ended up capturing a Soviet agent that wasn't there that was there instead of him. Now he's down at the lab, and I don't know what to do. I'm not going to tell you how badly you messed up, because I have the feeling that you're perfectly aware. First of all, take another deep breath. You can't appear nervous when talking to a hostage. Does it look like you could have some kind of inf important information? I guess. I mean, at the very least, you should know why the Soviets wanted the diamond. He said it's because it used to belong to them, but I'm not sure about that. The timing is very strange. They couldn't have come for it at any other time. Do you think I could ask the KGB for a ransom or hand him over to the League? No, I doubt he's important enough for the KGB to pay for him. And he won't be much use to the League if that's all he knows. Soviet agents operate on what's basically a need-to-know basis, and KGB's policy regarding captured agents is always to assume they have been compromised. Ugh, great. He's useless, then. Not exactly. I know a couple of people that still do work inside Soviet territory from time to time. Any information about why an agent was at the museum would be of interest to them. They have some leverage in the League, and they are the type, they are the type that doesn't like owing favors to others. If you make sure that no one finds out it was an accident, you can still make this look good enough for your application. Get him to talk. Make all this seem intentional. Yes, I can do that. Thank you, Mantis. I'm about to turn around to leave when she moves in in front of me and takes my hand in Harris. Don't forget, Keegan. You're in charge here. 
She squeezed a little harder, enough to make my fingers hurt. Mantis. Besides, if it comes down to it, you can always kill him and dispose of the body. I've just realized what, like, I've been annoyed that she's smoking inside. Because I'm, I'm just like, ah, supervillains. Like, I don't care if you're a supervillain trying to take over the world. But smoking inside, that's just, like, terrible. Um, and I realize I'm reminded of a character from the series, the comic book series Sleeper by, um, oh my gosh, I've forgotten the name of the writer. It's drawn by Sean Phillips and it's written by Ed Brubaker. And there was a character, what was her name? Like Ms. Misery or something. And, uh, it turned out that she had to constantly do terrible things. Uh, otherwise her body would be really sick. And so she like was constantly like hurting people and like smoking and drinking and and like screwing doing doing things that were not positive things and that was the only way that she could be healthy it was like it's a very messed up superhero series but it's very good as well superhero is in quotation marks super powered character series spies super powered spies it's it's good uh besides besides if it comes down to it you can always kill him and dispose of the body i'm sure that won't be necessary mantis oh keegan if i'm not willing to kill somebody if you're not willing to kill someone you should be a super villain of course not she laughs, letting me go before heading to unlock the door. I'm not sure if I go as far as to say I feel confident, but I now realize that I deal that I deal with far more intimidating people on a daily basis, and I do it pretty well. If I don't let them throw me around, some Soviet agent isn't going to be the one to ruin my plans. I really thought there'd be like uh more options in this. I didn't expect it to be so linear. The first thing that I notice when I enter the lab laboratory is that all the henchmen are gone, except for the one that helped me bring the Russian here in the first place. In their place, there were a couple of armed guards on the other side of the table. The change did the opposite of easing the tension in the room, and both guards looked slightly uncomfortable as they acknowledged me with a nod. I, wave, I wonder how you differentiate between guards and henchmen. Like, how do like how do they feel about this? Are they do they feel like do they each feel that they're better than the other person? Are they do they get paid the same amount? Are they in the same union? Uh, are they are they like subcontract to some other organization? I wave my hand, and they both step aside and make room for me. I clear my throat to get the attention of the agent. He raises his head, and the look he gives me is enough to send a shiver down my spine. It's like he's considering all the ways he could kill me. This is explains why the henchmen left and brought in the guards. I remember what Manta said to me as I straightened my back, and I returned the stare. It soon became a staring contest, neither of us wanting to be the first one to look away. Finally, it's me that gets unnerved, and I cough to dis dissimulate. I suppose it isn't hard for you to get out of your country after all, being an agent and everything. But since you're here already, let's see what use we can find for you, shall we? Here's the deal. I need information, and you have it. If you answer my questions, I promise I'll let you go. I won't talk. Don't be so stubborn. I'll have it one way or another. But you do get a say about how difficult this will be for you. This time, he doesn't even bother answering. I threaten him, try to appeal to him. Okay. Um, I feel threat. I don't think either of these will be very effective. So, threaten or appeal? Which one should I go with? I don't think I'm going to finish this game. So this, like, and judging by the number of choices I've had, this might be the last choice I get to make before the stream ends. So... I don't think my character can go through with threats. He was afraid of, like, uh, hurting someone. So let's try appealing to him. With truth serum, the risk of accidentally poisoning him is too high for my liking. Likewise, if I decide to torture the information out of him, there's a chance that he'll resist too much and he'll end up dying from the wounds. I didn't even have the truth serum choice. Besides, I'm not really a fan of blood. Even just thinking about it makes my stomach turn. Uh, okay, Reckless D, I'm glad you agreed with appeal. It will be much easier for everyone involved if he just decides to cooperate. Suit yourself, but I know that the KGB does to people that fail them. And even if you don't talk, just by letting yourself be captured, you've already failed. You know nothing. Don't I? Think about it. This is the perfect chance to start over. A new beginning. Away from everything. Oh. Uh, wait, I can translate you know nothing as well. Tu znajesh nichivo? That that is at least a, a, a partial approximation, I think. Like to to znaes nichivo. Uh no one will know what happened to you except for me, and frankly, I couldn't care less. 
You just need to answer some questions and you'll be free. There's no need to die for your country. He hesitates for a moment before shaking his head. Oh, Soviet spies will not fall for that. They will die for their country. There always is. Don't you have any family? Anyone you care about? You could help them this way too. Send them things. Get them out of the Soviet Union. I have a sister. She was sent away for a chess tournament and she never returned. I always wondered. I'm not surprised with a sudden confession, since that was exactly what I had hoped for. But by now he sounds... But by how he sounds when he says it, he even looks vulnerable for a second. But it doesn't matter. She was as good as dead at the moment she left. Chess tournaments. So deadly. Always. Like, only one... Only There's only one survivor at the chess tournaments. It's like Fortnite or, or player unknown Battlegrounds. I realized right then that perhaps I didn't think this one... As, as out as thoroughly as I should have, because I suddenly feel less like pressing him for information. I kind of want to like make now a visual novel that is a a game of some sort that is a like a battle royale thing over something really mundane, uh, but that people still die. Uh, I realized right then that perhaps I didn't think this out as thoroughly as I should have, because I suddenly feel less like pressing him for information. Okay, I read that away. He was set on not saying a word when I was only talking about his job, but as soon as his family came up, his attitude changed completely. If there's something I can sympathize with, it is losing family. I'll find out what happened to her for you. Then you can decide whether you'd like to speak after all. And I'm just supposed to believe you? No, of course not. But if you live, you can go see for yourself whether it's the truth. You'll get water and something to eat. I'll give you them orders to not mistreat you. But they'll make sure you don't escape. So don't try anything stupid. He tries... Yeah, okay. So here's the thing. Uh, my uncle is definitely going to find out that I have a kidnapped Soviet spy. Like 100%. Like, how fast am I going to be able to find out if this guy's sister is alive or not? Okay, I have also never encountered the word dissimulate before. Um, so it's interesting that it's shown up multiple times here. Uh, he tries he tries to dissimulate, but I can tell from, like, is it disassociate? I don't know. But I can tell from the look on his face that the henchman is really wishing for Sergei to give him an excuse to hurt him. On my way out, I glare at him to make sure that he doesn't get any funny ideas. I curse my moment of weakness all the way to the office. I was supposed to do one thing, get him to talk, and I somehow ended up promising something I'm not even sure I can do. Uh, what? Reckless T saying, what does the writer think dissimulate means? I I do not know. I, I've i never encountered... I'm Okay, you know what? I'm actually just going to look it up right now and see if I can find like a definition. Because maybe it is a perfectly fine... Maybe it is a perfectly cromulent word. Uh, okay. Dissimulate, to practice deception by concealment or omission or by feigning a false appearance, to hide or disguise by adopting a false appearance. Um, so I guess it could fit, but using it seems kind of strange in this context. I don't know. It just, like, I'm sure there, there are other words that you could use instead of this. Uh, okay. For one, I'm not sure that we have such information at hand. Oh yeah, you definitely don't have. Is this is this random Soviet agent's sister alive? She went to a chess tournament several years ago. Uh, and even if we like, I wonder which book has you know rel family members of Soviet spies in it. I think. Do you think it's the red one or the blue one? Uh, even if we do, I'm not sure I can access it. Um, thinking it's the Soros syndrome, I think. Yeah, it's it's definitely it could be the Soros sy syndrome. It could be that, or it could be that. Um, the writer of this might not speak English as their first language, and so they they translated a word that is in their language into English, and that was what like an auto translator or tra like dictionary gave them. And they're like, "This is clearly a perfectly cromulent English word. Let's just go with it." I almost forgot about Madame Mantis. She's probably still inside. Ugh, aren't I in the room that Madame Mantis was in? If I begin to go through fi the files that they're there, she's going to want to know what I want the information for. Her advice immediately comes to mind, and it sends a shiver down my spine. While well, I try to think of a way to get her out of the office, and somewhere else, I see one of the henchmen passing by. It's just some random guy from maintenance, which makes him perfect for what I have in mind. Are you a henchman if you're in maintenance? Like, wouldn't that be... Like, I feel like it's either everyone, every henchman has to do maintenance, or like, the people that do maintenance are not henchmen. Although I suppose it depends on what sort of maintenance it is. Like if it's like fixing super lasers, that's like henchman level maintenance. But if it's like cleaning the bathroom, that doesn't seem like henchman level maintenance. Like I know someone has to do it, but... Okay. Hey you! He looks around and points at himself as if making sure that I'm talking to him and not someone else. 
I gesture at him to come closer. Yes, you. Are you busy? He shakes his head. Do me a favor. Head to the lower level and call Madame Mantis. I don't care what you call her for. Just make sure she's busy for as long as possible. Luckily for me, most of the base's personnel don't deal directly with her very often, so as far as they're concerned, we're about as equally intimidating. And I have the advantage of being related to the boss. The henchman turns around, hurriedly heading toward the nearest elevator. I don't see why this guy is very intimidating. He doesn't seem intimidating in the least. Like, his uncle, sure, but him not so much. After a minute passes, about a minute passes until I see Mantis come out of the office, looking annoyed as she walks down the hall. As soon as I'm certain that she's gone, I go inside and lock the door behind me. Oh, there's the dot dot dot. That's in every one of these games. I spend the better part of an hour staring at the monitor as I go through the files. Okay, so we have a computer of some sort, but the Soviet Union still exists, so I wonder what sort of computer it is. Finding one that isn't classified is hard enough already. Finding one that doesn't require me to mess with my uncle's computer, more than necessary, is even more so. What's the deal with the man? I've seen world leaders whose files are less protected than this. I Like, Metamantis is gone for an hour? Anything remotely related to him is classified 10 times over. I'm shocked you can even get onto this computer. Like, if I was a supervillain, it would be, like, super locked down. Finally, I find one that looks promising enough. It's a list of notable people that defected, compiled for the purpose of letting supervillains know the pe of people that might be willing to work for them. Because it has hundreds of names, and most of them aren't actually important, it must have slipped through the cracks. I keep scrolling until I find someone that matches Sergei's description, who I'm pretty sure is his sister. There aren't many female chess players that left the scene after an important match, after all. Ah, she moved to America under a new identity. That makes sense. I, does it? From the looks of it, she retired from chess and has been living a quiet life since then. In the end, I don't find much information beyond that, but at least it's better than nothing. While I go over the files once more to make sure that they're just as I found them, I pick up the phone and I call the lab. When the henchman answers, I can hear the guards arguing with each other in the background. It's not a good sign. I've got what I need. I'll be down in a minute. Go tell the guards to ready the vehicle and to deliver Sergei to the garage when it's done. I want him tied up and blindfolded. We'll drop him at the nearest city. The henchman takes too long to answer, and since I just know that's a sign that he's about to protest in some way, I continue talking. The sooner he's out of here, the sooner this is over with. Maybe it'll even look like we know what we're doing if there isn't an angry rush in the middle of the laboratory by tomorrow morning. He doesn't sound too convinced as he hangs up, but I honestly couldn't care less about his opinions at this point. When I get back to the lab, I expect to see the henchman escorting Sergei outside, and maybe with the help of a couple of guards. I'm very confused as to why I'm doing this. Uh... He hasn't given us any information, so we're telling him about his sister and letting him go? Those are my instructions, after all. Instead, I find just the two of them standing in the middle of the room. Sergei has a red cloth covering his mouth, and his hands are handcuffed behind his back. I thought he was strapped to a table. The henchman is struggling to push him towards one of the back doors, but they aren't heading towards an exit. That door in particular leads to the aquarium, where my uncle keeps the sharks and other dangerous aquatic life forms where they are not in use. What are you doing? I told you to get him out of here. The henchman turns around, and for a moment he looks he has a look of annoyance on his face, but he quickly changes to something more apologetic as he realizes who he's talking to. Boss, I thought I don't care what you thought. Do I have to do everything myself? Move aside, I'm escorting him on my own. He doesn't move, so I end up pushing him out of the way and grabbing the back of Sergei's coat. Given how much taller he is, I have to stretch my arm upwards to get a proper grip. If I wasn't so angry, I'd feel rather ridiculous. I thought he was in a chair? I'm clearly Yes, okay, it's been an hour. I'm clearly not reading this as, as thoroughly as I could. But instead of staying out of the way, the henchman moves ahead of us and pushes the button that locks the door. What do you think you're doing? Something I tried very hard to avoid. You just couldn't kill him, could you? You had to go and make everything more difficult. Now I'll have to kill you both. Put your hands on your head and stand next to Sergei. I stand still for a moment, trying to make sense of the situation. Do you think it's the American agent in disguise? Before I can say or do anything, I see him put a hand inside his shirt and take out a gun. He's pointing it at us, his finger resting on the trigger. I let Sergei go and take a step back. Suddenly he breaks his handcuffs and with his hands now free, rips the cloth covering his mouth. The henchman hesitates and that second is all Sergei needs to grab him in a chokehold, pulling him away from the door while trying to get him to drop the gun. Quick, open the door. I get to the keypad, but nothing I do unlocks the door. I can't activate the alarm either as the only things I get when I try is an error message. He overrode my codes. Sergei isn't any more successful and the henchman elbows him so hard that he knocks him backwards and he has to take a moment to catch his breath. Since I can't do anything about the door, I begin doing, going through the drawers, desperately trying to find something useful. All I manage to find is a small handgun, so it will have to do. Unfortunately, I'm not a good shot, and between my nerves and lack of practice, I don't even come close to hitting the henchman when I fire. It's enough to startle him, however, and Sergei used the opportunity to run towards me. He's got a gun now, too. Uh, oh wait, so this is my casual outfit? Like, with apple nuts? <laughs> 
He pushes the table on its side, and we both duck behind it, using it as cover. Almost immediately, he snatches the gun away from my hand. Oh, okay, he stole my gun. That's a small handgun? Hey! The one who can actually shoot a target at point-blank range gets the gun, especially because we only have five bullets left. I... Okay, I'm not very knowledgeable about guns. And quite happily so. However, I... Like... Lots of guns have more than six bullets, and I don't know if that that doesn't look like one that would have only six bullets. Don't move. He leans to the side slightly, just enough to get his hand and part of his head from behind the table. Fuck, I can't see him anymore. You two know each other, don't you? He looks at me for about a second before he turns around and goes back to keeping an eye on the laboratory. I'm pretty sure that he's not going to answer me, but then he sighs. His name is Yakov. We used to work together. Oh, before he defected. I'd heard the rumors, but I didn't think he'd actually become a mercenary. He's a shame for more than just the KGB. He's a shame for the whole Soviet Union. I didn't recognize him at first, but when he spoke to me, I realized that it was him. A mercenary? That's impossible. He's been here for months. I conducted all the interviews around the time. I conducted all the interviews around the time he was hired myself. I'd have noticed if there was anything suspicious. Sergey gives me a skeptical look. Quite rightly, I'm sure a KGB spy could fool this like 20-year-old kid guy. Admittedly, being shot by someone I hired is not the ideal situation to argue about my ability to judge people. He said his original contract was for someone called Sphinx. He hesitates a little before saying the name, as if he was trying to recall exactly where he had heard it before. Uncle! I don't find out whether he remembers, because it's me who messes up. I bite my tongue, but it's too late. In the heat of the moment, I let it slip that we're related. He came here for your uncle? Do you really want to talk about that right now? Yes. He's interrupted with the sound of an alarm as the white light of the laboratory lamps is replaced by an intermittent red flash. What's that? Shit, that's why he didn't shoot at us when we ran to hide. It's the evacuation alarm. And it can be evacuated from any room? Is it just for evacu- Activated from any room? Is it just for evacuation? By anyone with a code, yes. It wouldn't be much of an alarm otherwise, would it? I'm, like, I feel like I'm coming to a climax, but I don't know how much more of this is left, and I don't know how much more I want to play. But more important, once activated, it purges everything inside the base. It's basically a self-destruction sequence. How long do we have? About 20 minutes, give or take. Depends on how much data the computer has to erase beforehand. Think, think. He overrode my code, but my uncle can't be. But my uncle's can't be because it's also the master password. There's nothing I can do about the alarm, but I can use another code to open the door. Then we can get out. Good, stand up then. What? If he doesn't shoot, he's gone. If he shoots, I can see where he's doing it from his shoot back. Except he has to shoot me for that. Sergei glares at me, and I get the impression that if I don't stand up on my own, he's just going to throw me outside anyway, so I do it. Mere seconds later, a bullet grazes my arm from behind one of my uncle's machines. Sergei notices it too, and quickly shoots twice in succession. The first one hits the henchman in the arm, making him drop his gun, and the second goes straight through his leg, making him fall to the ground. Sergei runs around and kicks the gun as far as he can, then uses his free hand to forcibly drag the henchman from behind the machine. I take a second to check my arm. It hurts like hell, but it's not too bad, nothing that will cause permanent damage at least. Deciding that it is as safe as it's going to get, I go to the keypad and begin to work on unlocking the door. Just like I thought, the henchman had no way of disabling my uncle's code, so it's a matter of trying them all until I find one that works and the door opens. <laughs> Does this kid know his uncle's code, or is he just ra typing in random buttons? Done. Let's get out of here. What do you want to do with him? I take a look at the henchman, who's pressing his hand against his wound to slow down the bleeding. If it were me, I'd just leave him here, but something tells me that my uncle is going to want to have a word or two with him once he finds out about all this. Right, I suppose we should take him with us. You're lucky it wasn't Sphinx who had to go through this. Who says he wasn't? You haven't seen him since you arrived, have you? Mantis did. Are you sure? I make a pause while I think. Actually, no. She said that he'd gone to take care of some business before I arrived. Not that she'd seen him. We both know that the hangar is all the way over at the other side of the base. You won't make it in time if you decide to take me with you. Since thanks to Sergei, I can't walk on my own. So you can either go looking for him, or you can... Make sure that we all get out of here together, but you can't do both. I could leave you with Sergei. He looks just about as upset as I feel. Sure, leave the two Soviets together. What could go wrong? I go check on my uncle, head straight to the hangar. Like, is my uncle even here? I think my uncle can take care of himself. Like, he's 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 the big time supervillain. Let's go straight to the hangar. Do you know how many assassinations attempts he survived? All kinds of people have tried to get rid of him, and they've all failed. You wouldn't be able to kill my uncle even with all the luck in the world on your side. And even if you did, that's another good reason for taking you with me. I look at Sergei. Sergei, if we make it out of here, I'll keep my word and let you go. I'll tell you what I found out about your sister, but now I need you to help me carry him. It's not like he has much choice either way. I could leave without him if I wanted, but not the other way around. 
He seems to realize this as well, because he kneels down and throws the henchman over his shoulder without protest. The henchman lets out a groan of pain as blood begins to trickle down from his wounds, but neither Sergei nor I pay much attention to it. We get to the hangar about two minutes later, just in time to see the rest of the personnel loading the last things into the vehicles, but my uncle is nowhere to be found. Sergei hands over the henchman to a couple of guards. They are understandably suspicious at first, but since it's not the moment to question the situation, they take him away. Despite the fact that the whole process takes another few minutes, my uncle and Mantis are still nowhere to be found. It's not long before I begin to panic. What if the henchman did get to them? Did I make a mistake by not trying to find him before coming here? My brain tells me that he can't wait any longer, but I can't bring myself to leave. In the end, Sergei has to physically drag me out of the base and onto one of the very last vehicles available before we get out of the base. Awkward sentence. It takes us about a month to get the layer back into something resembling a working shape, and I'm not entirely sure we succeeded. The mercenary damaged a lot of sensitive equipment with the stunt he pulled, and... Okay, I missed something. What did the mercenary do other than- Oh, okay, I guess he pulled the evacuation alarm, which, like, deleted data, which could damage equipment. And though buying replacements is easy enough, it still takes a lot to, of hands to set it up. I don't have the nerve to tell my uncle that I'm planning to move out once I sell the diamond, which Sergei conveniently still had, and which he agreed to hand to me in exchange for employment. My uncle had been pretty understanding, all things considered, so I don't want to push my luck by upsetting him. I finish filling the box with the parts that need to be thrown away, and I pick it up. Hmph, Sergei was supposed to be here hours ago. Sergei, come over here. We need to figure, finish moving these. There's no answer. I don't keep an eye on him. Oh, it looks, unfortunately, it looks like the one piece of equipment we wanted to have damaged, that weird light like photo light whiteboard thing is still there if only that had been blown up i don't keep an eye on him constantly based on the fact that he's more competent than half the henchmen here put together but that doesn't mean i can have him running around unsupervised sergey i put down the box put the box back down and head outside my uncle is standing at the other end of the hall ordering a henchman on a ladder while he installs it and tests the new security cameras i waited at him to get his attention uncle have you seen the russian he says something to the henchman before he's walking over to me not since yesterday. I thought he was busy with you. Have you checked the laboratory? No, but he doesn't have any reason to be there. The laboratory was the first thing we took care of, remember? That doesn't mean he won't be there. Mistakes begin with oversights. Let's go. I was headed- Oh, sorry, I'm supposed- This thing is like, Let's go! I was heading there anyway. We both head to the laboratory. But when we get there, Sergei's nowhere to be found. In fact, none of the people supposed to be here are. Yet, the only thing that seems out of place is the severed arm on top of the table. I'm sorry, what? Holy shit, there's an arm on the table. My uncle pushes me back immediately, stepping in front of me as he takes a quick look around to make sure that, that we're actually alone. The room is completely silent, except for the sound of the clock ticking. Wait here. If anything happens, go call Mantis. He takes out a pen from his pocket, approaches the table carefully but surely. Once he's close enough, he begins to prod the arm with the blunt end of the pen, first moving it slightly to the side, and then turning it over completely. The arm makes a metallic, rather displeasing sound, and a thick blue liquid begins to leak from the inside of, and onto the table. What is this arm? This arm is so much more interesting than so much of the other rest. On a metallic arm, unattached to things, with thick blue liquid out of, leaking out of it. Yeah, yeah, okay. In the chat, what? I really agree. What is this arm? What is going on? Whoever it is, there's a good amount of it. It doesn't stop until there's a puddle under the arm, and by then, some has gotten on the floor, too. My uncle puts down the pen before cleaning his hands with the end of his shirt. You can come, cl you can come closer now. The arm is a prosthesis, and this is just tinted hydraulic fluid i go stand next to him and i see what he means almost right away well on the outside it looks like any other arm rather than exposed flesh and bone the severed end has metal parts and cables of varying lengths sticking out of it and just like that the arm goes from horrifying to fascinating what's that under all the mess i notice a piece of paper slightly sticking out from under the arm i pick up the pen that my uncle was using and finish getting the arm out of the way the paper is stained and it threatens to tear down tear if I so much as touch it, but the writing is legible enough for me to be able to read it with some effort. When I begin, I feel my knees go weak from the shock. I briefly consider getting rid of it, but since I drew my uncle's attention to its presence, it's already too late. The paper is a note from Sergei. Apologies for leaving so abruptly. Blah blah. I'm not returning to the Soviet Union. Blah blah. Rest assured, I won't say anything. That son of a that son of a bitch left. This is his arm. Sergei was a cyborg? And that didn't come up before this. Sergei somehow having a fake arm and having ripped it off himself by himself seems to register in my brain. I'm so confused as to what's going on. I'm more preoccupied with the fact that since I was the one who convinced my uncle to let Sergei stay here, this is yet another of my mistakes. I don't even need to look at him to be able to tell he's frowning. I take a step back while I try to think of something to stay to calm him down. 
Wait, let's take another look at the arm. Even if you left it behind because there's something wrong with it, it's still an impressive piece of equipment. When was the last time that you saw such an intricate prosthesis? prosthesis? Imagine all the things that we could do with it. Just the arm itself is proof that the Soviets have been working on it as well. That seems to do it. My uncle raises an eyebrow and he considers what I just said. And while he still looks rather upset, now he looks more intrigued. Go get something to clean this up while I prepare the laboratory. He doesn't need to tell me twice. I, okay, this was described as like... Where is the description I had of this? Like a boy's love game? Blind man. Okay, a parody of spy fiction is a boy's love visual novel that follows a young supervillain as he carries out his first big heist. Uh, keep the game as cliched as a cliched filled parody or turn it into a straight adventure. I'm super confused. I guess maybe this is just going to keep going after this. I thought there'd be more romance. Yeah. Um, I turn around and leave. It's a shame that things with Sergei didn't work out as intended, but I can't help but be a little impressed by a man who was willing to rip his own arm off and leave. Who knows? Maybe we'll meet again sometime. Okay. I feel I missed at least three scenes there at the end. One. <laughs> Reckless D. I'm sorry. You, you thought this, this game would be gayer. I also thought it would be gayer. I'm sorry it was not as gay as either of us expected. Maybe if I flirted more with the American guy, it would have become... It was gay then. Um, but I just didn't like him personally. Uh, like, it went from, oh no, where is my uncle? Is he going to die when this place explodes or something? To a month later, everything is fine. And then the Russian guy rips his arm off and leaves. And like, why did he rip his arm off? Was he the winter soldier? Like he, Bucky had a robot arm, right? That, yeah, that wasn't entirely coherent, says Reckless T. And I really have to agree with that. Um, like a good concept, like decent art, but didn't really stick the, the landing to me. Anyway, uh, that's kind of too bad. I wonder what, if they're like, maybe there are other routes that make more sense, but this one was not, not the best. Okay. Anyway, uh, I, so thanks for checking out the stream. Um, my podcast is called book club for masochists, a reader's advisory podcast. Uh, where is the, here it is. No, this one, you can go to book club, book club for M.com. Uh, to check out the podcast, the episode about visual novels will be out in September. Uh, our most recent genre episode was about alternative history, alternative or alternate history fiction. Um, and you can find it on Apple Podcasts or Google Podcasts or anywhere like that. Uh, tomorrow, I'll be back and I'll be streaming um, Speed Dating for Ghosts. So maybe that one will provide the opportunity for more gay dates. I, I hope there's more dating. Like... If there's not, if there's no dating in Speed Dating for Ghosts, I'm going to be very disappointed is really what it comes down to. <laughs> anyway, thanks for checking out the stream and uh, have a great evening or day or morning, whatever time of day it is. Have a great day.